Morning, everybody. Uh, apologies, we're a few minutes late. We've had some uh, IT issues, but we found a way around it. Um, but that's the modern world, isn't it? Um, so I hope everybody's okay. And uh, if you have queries, um, by all means, uh, at the end of the, the slideshow, um, uh, whatever it is, leave a message or, or, or get in touch with me. Uh, I'm happy either way. Um, you should be able to see on the screen um, the, the slides uh, that I've prepared for you today. Um, I know some of you uh, have seen uh, me speak before this year. Um, there's been so many VAT changes uh, this year, so apologies if you've seen uh, some of the slides before or, or heard me speak on, on some of these issues before, um, but there will be something new for, for everybody um, in, in these slides. Um, so uh, without uh, wasting any more time, um, let's press forward. I'll talk to you today about um, Brexit, obviously the first big change and the one-stop shop which moves neatly on from it, which is change um, trading in the, the EU. Um, there was obviously the, the change for the construction service this year, um, the domestic reverse charge, which has caused a few headaches. Um, and then I'll talk about a few other bits and pieces which um, in an ordinary year would be uh, making the headlines, but um, uh, but not this year. So Brexit, what are we talking about with these? Well, at the start of the year, obviously, uh, the UK, well, Great Britain, left uh, the EU uh, and created imports of goods from the EU and exports of goods uh, from Great Britain, created a new regime for Northern Ireland, question marks over services, and a, a topic I get asked frequently about, I don't know how much people actually talk about it uh, when uh, uh, they're advising uh, clients, um, the margin scheme. So Brexit uh, on imports, what are we talking about there? We're talking about goods which enter Great Britain. I'm not going to say the UK because Northern Ireland is, is different. Um, and those goods are coming into Great Britain from not just the EU, um, but any uh, any country outside the UK. Um, the rules, the import rules have changed across the board for all, all imports now. And uh, with Northern Ireland being a unique that jurisdiction, I'll talk about them a little bit later. Um, but as a, a rule of thumb, my first question is, who's going to be the importer of record? So when the goods come into Great Britain, they're clearing through customs, UK customs. Who's being stated to UK customs as the importer? And this is a really important question because only the owner of the goods can claim import VAT as input tax. This was a, a change that HMRC um, brought in a couple of years ago. They, Think of it more as a clarification of uh, a principle that was already there, but um, but people didn't operate this way, and it, it did um, cause some problems for um, quite major uh, suppliers, um, such as supermarkets, um, who I, I didn't realise this. Um, many of the items on their shelves didn't belong to them, uh, imported sale or return, um, and there were back-to-back um, transactions at the till, um, and to import those items and not be able to reclaim the VAT because they are not the owner when the goods uh, arrive in Great Britain. What was a real issue? Battled uh, with HMRC over it for a year and HMRC simply restated their policy. So this, this is clear um, now for, for imports into Great Britain. The importer has to be the owner of the goods if they want to claim the import VAT back. Um, otherwise, it'll become an additional cost. Um, other um, considerations, um, make sure you've got an EORI number with GB at the front. That will enable you to be recognised by UK Customs and clear the goods through. That will um, prevent delays. Frankly, an EORI number is just a few days to get hold of. It's really easy. It's your VAT number with a few zeros after it. Um, it really is worth applying for in advance, um, it, even if you're not really expecting many imports just so it's there when you have an emergency and need to import something. Postpone VAT accounting. 
Um, what is it? It's, um, well, uh, before Brexit, traditionally goods would come in to uh, uh, Great Britain from outside the EU, and you'd pay, physically pay the import VAT. Your agent would do it for you, claim it back from you in, in a, a, an invoice um, to you. Well, that's a cash flow loss. You have to wait until HMRC refund that import VAT to you um, pre-Brexit. Now, postponed VAT accounting has been introduced. And what postponed VAT accounting is, is you're able not to pay, physically pay the import VAT as the goods go through customs. You record it as a liability in your next VAT return. And you claim the, the import VAT back in the same VAT return. So there's no cash flow loss there at all. Uh, there are a few restrictions, but frankly, not many. We're talking about things like um, excise goods, alcohol, cigarettes. You, if this can be, spoke about accounting, can generally speaking be used um, for, for all imports. So why wouldn't you? Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a moment as well. Um, one key part about PVA, I suppose, about accounting, you do have to get a monthly import statement from HMRC, which is online. Um, and I'll talk about that um, in a moment uh, as well. When we're looking at um, postponed VAT accounting, there have been teething problems. And some of you may have come across this. Um, some of you may simply need to be aware of it um, and, and others of you um, uh, may need to um, flag this up um, to your clients. We're talking about things like um, you've imported goods, you've got your monthly statement, it's not on there. Um, what, what do you do? Do you just ignore the, the import, you don't record the liability? Typically, it's um, it was a, a sort of IT failure or some sort of reporting failure by the, the agent where um, the goods have been recorded in the wrong month and they just haven't appeared in, in the monthly statement from HMRC. And, and normally this can be worked out. If it's anything more major than that, um, I'd be very wary of not declaring a liability um, and simply ignoring it. Um, HMRC can impose penalties for potentially lost revenue, and we don't want to go down that route. If you've got questions, by all means, um, uh, get in contact, uh, and we'll we'll uh, we'll guide you if um, if that's straightforward, uh, or, or we'll we'll talk to um, to HMRC on your behalf. You don't need authorization, by the way, for postponed VAT accounting. You simply go ahead and and, and do it. Um, but obviously, when you come to customs and the goods are, are, are waiting to be cleared through. Customers expect payment, so you have to tell them that you're not going to be making payment because you're using postponed VAT accounting. H how do you do that? Well, it could be that you're paying the transporter and, and you simply tell them, um, or it could be that you're buying something from a, a supplier outside the UK who Yes, they're delivering goods from outside the UK into Great Britain, um, but you've agreed to act as the importer. So your supplier needs to be told you're going to use postponed VAT accounting. Your supplier can tell their transport to record the import as postponed VAT accounting, along with all of your details, the URI number, the VAT number, delivery address, and so on. Uh, and, and then the postponed VAT accounting will be recorded uh, as part of the import then you can go on to HMRC's website, access your monthly statement. That is your justification for reclaiming the VAT. So you'll get hit with the liability. If you don't claim it back, it becomes a cost. You need the monthly statement to justify the reclaim. And just one word on the monthly statement, it's only there on HMRC's website for six months. So if you're thinking, well, I'll just store it on HMRC's website, HMRC turn up in the next four years for a routine inspection, look through a, a random uh, back return and say, ah, so you've claimed your import VAT back. Um, could you show me the, the justification for it? I know where that is. And you log in that, that monthly statement that you relied on will not be there anymore. Uh, and that can be, that can be a problem. So download them as a PDF, keep them as part of your VAT records would be, would be my advice. 
With imports, um, it was thought that uh, the £15 de minimis threshold pre-Brexit was too small. Um, it wasn't really being very helpful um, anymore to anybody. And the de minimis threshold below which you don't need to account for import duty or import VAT was raised to £135. And that sounds like a really good thing. And it is a really good thing, um, providing you're making your supplies in uh, import, sorry, in consignments of £135 or below in value. If you do, there'll be no import VAT. There will be VAT on the sale only. Um, as the importer, you can uh, apply the reverse charge um, even to that um, supply VAT so that your customer, your business fat registered customer, um, will be reverse charging it themselves. And as a seller, this is looking like a really good thing. Um, overseas seller, um, you'll be required to, to register for, for UK VAT for, for your sales in, in the UK. But if you're selling through an online marketplace, the marketplace will be responsible um, for sorting out the, the import and, and the onward sales VAT. I mean, it, as an overseas seller, this, this is the solution that, that probably you've been looking for. Sounds perfect, but the difficulties come, as you may have found yourselves already, when you start to consider what happens if you get an order above £135. Okay, you might split that into two consignments to avoid having to um, deal with all the import VAT and, and the onward supply. Online marketplaces will no longer be responsible for the onward sale uh, if it's over £135, so you just want to get rid of all of those, those issues. But if you've got an item that is £135 of value by itself, some of my clients uh, work in, in the fashion industry, some of my clients um, uh, import machinery. Um, and yes, some of the parts might be below £135, but a £200 machine, you can't cut it in two. And you're going to have to start working out which of your supplies, uh, your imports, sorry, you're going to be responsible for, for the VAT on import, and which of the supplies you're not? What if you sell some things through an online marketplace and some not? And, and suddenly you've, you've got this distinction, which if it's easy to, to systematize, brilliant. Um, if it's causing difficulties in working out who's responsible and who isn't, and how you deal with it, suddenly it starts to become that a little bit more complicated. Uh, and maybe this isn't um, uh, the, the nirvana that we were hoping for. So just, just to sort of round that up, um, what are we looking for? Um, what, what, what would you be doing with, with your GB imports? It, it's, it's not a, a, a single solution. You've really got to look at what it is that your own situation is. But do get your EORI number in advance. Um, it, it's very straightforward and it will save holdups. Do you use postponed VAT accounting? It's going to save you cash flow. Why wouldn't you? Do make preparations. Think about the £135 threshold. You might not be required to, to account for import VAT. You might not even be required to account for VAT on your onward sale in the UK. But you might be, and there'll be circumstances probably where you are, and what will you do about that? Think it through, um, have a, a solution ready. And, and this is a bit of a, a watchword with me. Communicate, talk to everybody in the supply chain. If you're the customer, talk to your supplier. You might have a reverse charge you need to account for. And, um, and the, the seller is, is relying on you to do that and you're simply not aware. Um, or it might be you are the seller um, and you're, you're selling through um, a, an online marketplace. Uh, and maybe you need to talk to an online marketplace, make sure that that's what they're doing. I've had um, various issues with online marketplaces in, in the early uh, months of, of 2021. Let's look at exports. Um, exports from Great Britain, Northern Ireland again, slightly different, um, from Great Britain to an EU customer. Zero rated, as we know, providing you've got all the documentation uh, and all the rest of it um, as pre-Brexit for, for exports. Need your GB or your number again for exports to declare yourself identified customs. So let's get that early. 
Um, it's fairly straightforward. Are we thinking this is even easier than, than imports? Are we thinking this is even easier than before Brexit? The dispatches that we had to fill out, the EC sales list we had to fill out. Well, yes, you're absolutely right if that's what, what you're thinking, because there's much less to do and you still get all the VAT back on your purchases. There's no VAT on your sales. It's all very straightforward. The tricky part comes when you think about those goods entering the EU. Because there we have an import into the EU and we start to get all the questions that we were just considering from the GB import perspective. In other words, who is going to be acting as the importer? Who's the importer of record? Is it going to be your customer? In which case, things remain simple for you. But you've transferred all of the requirements onto your customer. And what does that mean? Well, if they're uh, that registered customer in, let's say, Hungary, you've exported your goods from Great Britain, zero rated, got me back back on costs, brilliant. And you've asked your Hungarian VAT registered customer to use the Hungarian VAT registration number to act as importer, this Hungarian import VAT. They account for the liability, they recover it back in the Hungarian VAT returns, all neutral for them. Uh, fantastic. Except we have been seeing 10%, 20% of business customers starting to say, uh, I am no longer comfortable acting as importer, whether it's because there's a cash flow disadvantage, whether it's because they're having to deal with the tax authorities regularly and they just don't feel comfortable doing that, um, or, or whether they've had problems, whatever it is, um, that they, they, they simply say no. Um, we'll only buy from you if we don't have to carry out these import processes. Uh, and if we can't buy from you, then we'll buy from somebody within the EU, some, somebody similar in, in Poland or, or France or something. And suddenly it's becoming a, a reputational issue. It's becoming a practical issue. It's becoming a loss of your EU market issue. And can we find another way? And if that's if you've got a business, because if you've got a, a, an individual that you're selling to, in, in the EU, you export from Great Britain, zero rated, fantastic. And you push all the requirements onto the individual. Well, it, I don't know about you, but I've, I've bought stuff online for, for, for years. Um, some things come from China or Taiwan or the USA or something, um, arrived on my, my doormat, fantastic. Every so often I get a little card through from, from some transport or other saying, Actually, there's uh, import VAT to pay on this. There's import duty to pay on this. Um, and you're going to have to come and collect it at some time that's inconvenient to you, um, miles away, uh, and you can't get your hands on that item until until you do all of this, paying processing fees, everything else. And you walk up to, to um, the depot, pay it, collect it two or three weeks later, walk away swearing you'll never buy from that supplier ever again reputational issue again. So you're going to have to be clear with your customers, whether that's an individual or a business, what their role is going to be, that they are going to have these extra responsibilities and do that as early as you can. This communication thing, um, it really does flush out the issues which will otherwise mean it's going to get stuck at customs or you're going to have other problems. Um, currently, transporters are... Uh, some of them are refusing to act for um, B2C supplies. What they're actually saying is, I need an EORI number, otherwise I won't import into the EU. Well, if it's an individual bringing their own goods in, they don't need a, an EU EORI number. They don't. It's the transporter's way of saying, I'm having problems when I bring stuff in for individuals. They say, I'm not going to be paying the import duty. I didn't agree to that. I wasn't expecting that. And they send the goods back and the poor old transporter's stuck in the middle uh, messing around, they don't want to do with it anymore, quite understandably. So it's it's important to talk to everybody in the chain, get it very clear, get that written into your contractual terms. There are scenarios where maybe you'll think about, I don't have many people but I, in Romania, in uh, Bulgaria, in Croatia, where I'm, I'm selling uh, items to, but I don't want to close them off completely. If I get one, I'll just send it through and it'll be their responsibility. And if they if they kick up a fuss, they kick up a fuss. I'm not 
really worried about losing that customer. Fair, fair enough. Um, but if you want to start building uh, a, a genuine market in the EU with good reputation, this is going to be an issue. There are course alternatives to consider the one-stop shop. We will come to that later. But essentially what you're doing is you're balancing the administrative burden on you if you're going to act as the importer versus the commercial risk of pushing all those burdens onto your customer um, and potentially it being an issue. But communication, again, very important. Online marketplaces, we talked about that on imports. Um, they could be responsible for um, the, the VAT on sales uh, in Great Britain when they're imported from outside the UK. Well, that's also going to potentially be the case for uh, goods moving into the EU as well. And we will see that. Online marketplaces for the last five, six years have been they've had bur additional burdens placed on them in respect to VAT being jointly responsible with uh, importers, overseas um, sellers uh, for, for VAT, making sure they're registered, making sure they pay the VAT, all the rest of it, um, uh, warehouses and, and so on. This is another step in trying to control the black market online where uh, VAT is not accounted for. Very unfair on um, UK GB um, online sellers who do have to account for the VAT and do get policed. Um, very unfair for um, non-UK sellers uh, for whom it was very difficult to, to police and make sure that that was, was accounted for. But the problem comes on online marketplace clients. And I, I have several clients who are pulling their hair out trying to work out when they're responsible, when they're not responsible, can they make it easier for their clients? Um, how how do they get registered for VAT in every EU country to account for imports into the EU coming from, from Great Britain? Some even stopped selling into the EU for, for their sellers while they tried to sort it all out. It's been very difficult. There are solutions out there, um, but it's it's not straightforward. And, and if you have any queries, please, please raise your hand and, and uh, we'll address them. Services, very often forgotten um, in Brexit. I don't think they're talked about a huge amount in, in the press, and maybe they ought to be. What are we talking about? If you export a service, zero rated, brilliant, same as goods, getting all the VAT back on costs, fantastic. What perhaps hasn't really been gone into very much is the opportunity that exists post Brexit. So if you were, if I was supplying, for example, my consultancy services to an individual in the EU, before Brexit, I'd have charged UK VAT to them. Now, I zero rate my supply to them, which either makes me cheaper, so I get more individual clients in the EU, or um, I, I, my price is my price as far as the individual is concerned, which is really the case normally, um, and that's more um, profit from, from, from my perspective as a supplier. There is... Uh, there are overrides, uh, uh, use of enjoyment uh, is, is how it's referred to. And essentially it means if uh, somebody in the EU government, uh, Italy, let's say, um, decides that the service is being used or enjoyed within Italy and not being subject to VAT because the place of supply is outside the EU altogether, which in this case it will be, the example I just gave, Italy can decide that for all those kinds of services, Italian VAT will apply. And I, as a supplier, would have to go and register for Italian VAT at that point. It's very rarely applied this. The UK, um, where I can speak with knowledge, it had very few of, of this kind of um, use and enjoyment override. Uh, it's it's a default position, is, is it just doesn't apply. And many, uh, most, all, I think, EU member states simply haven't, uh, taken the trouble to, to impose it. So we're probably okay on this and we have a genuine opportunity to zero eight supplies. I'm not aware that there's a list of 27 use and enjoyment override rules, unfortunately. Um, so if you're in doubt, the numbers are big, uh, probably worth um, worth inquiring into. Financial services as well. Um, let's see, what did we do? If, if before Brexit, you'd make a supply in the financial services industry. Many of those supplies are exempt. 
You know, you can't get the VAT back on your costs, but meaning you don't charge VAT to your customer if you're supplying the EU. Well, okay, yeah, that's 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 how it is. Coming up to Brexit, we're all sort of wondering whether, well, the EU will no longer be part of our jurisdiction. Will that make the supplies of financial services similar to supplies to the USA or to China uh, or anywhere outside the EU before Brexit? where instead of an exempt supply, you'd be making a zero rated supply. And what's the difference? You're not charging VAT to your customer. Why does that make an effect? Well, because you can recover VAT on attributable costs with a zero rated supply, and you can't with an exempt one. Why is that important? Well, most advisors don't have significant uh, costs to recover that on. If you look at FinTech startups, they put a lot of money into technology as VAT and all of those services. Um, they'll be buying in uh, advice uh, or startup assistance from uh, accountants, uh, lawyers, uh, and so on to draw up terms and conditions. All that VAT can be recovered and can be really substantial. And maybe there's a planning opportunity there. If you start up with a trial market in the EU, zero rate your supply, get all the VAT back, start to introduce in, in the UK. It's a solution. It may not work. It needs delicate handling, but it's an opportunity. And it should be talked through with clients um, who are in a position where they're making exempt supplies. Margin scheme. Um, I did mention at the start, I, I get a lot of queries and I'm not sure how many people are really talking about this. Margins, let, let's make sure we, we all know what we're talking about here. The, the margin scheme means you're only accounting for VAT on the uplift, so your margin, your profit, uh, rather than VAT on the entire sales price. But you can't recover VAT on, on your purchases. Now, why is that helpful? I mean, you, if you pay VAT on your purchases and can't get it back, and you also pay VAT on the uplift, pay that to HMRC once you receive it from the customer, surely there's VAT on the wholesale price one way or another, which ends up with, with HMRC. It doesn't change anything. And again, you'd be absolutely right. The advantage comes when there's no VAT on your purchase. So why doesn't everybody do it? You can only use the margin scheme on certain categories of goods, you know, your artworks or um, antiques or what have you, second-hand items. Um, and those you normally, as a business, you normally buy those from private collectors or individuals and sell them on. No VAT on your costs. No VAT on the full sales price, only VAT on the uplift. And in an industry where margins are often 10, 20%, makes the difference between a viable business and a business that simply doesn't make a profit. So the margin scheme is important. And before Brexit, you could go online, find items that you thought were really good value, bring them in, keep them in the UK, sell them on. And you could still use the margin scheme. Post-Brexit, that's now an import, and there's import VAT. And remember, you can't get the VAT back onto the margin scheme. Other way around, selling into the EU, there's now an import into the EU. And remember, if you try and use the margin scheme in the EU, you can't get the VAT back on your import. So many clients were coming to me saying, I use the margin scheme, I'm going to have to close down my EU market. And I'm going to have to let go all these employees that were helping me service the EU market. And my response was, it may not be as bad as you think. There are solutions here. You can look at the imports and most, well, it's in the law, EU member states, UK included, has a reduced rate of VAT on imports for for certain margin scheme goods. So in the UK, that's 5%. You can't get that 5% back, but it does mean that a margin of 10%, 20% is going to be viable as a business where it wouldn't have been before. It's not without its pain. You still have to put the right registrations in place. You are going to have to pay an extra import VAT. There are some categories of goods, for the life of me, I don't know why, which are excluded margin scheme goods, but they're excluded from the import at reduced rate. 
Um, there was a scenario with second-hand vehicles where uh, you could use the margin scheme for onward sale supplies of, of second-hand vehicles. But again, you couldn't because um, of a Brexit. With Northern Ireland, um, there was a lot of lobbying of, of politicians in, in the UK. And in Northern Ireland, um, it was permitted to use the margin scheme for supplies of goods Great Britain to Northern Ireland. If you're in that position as a margin scheme seller, do lobby. We've lost our voice at the EU table. We've still got a bit of say um, over Northern Ireland. And in any case, who knows what's going to be um, allowed or not allowed uh, when we discuss with the EU in future years. Make sure it's on the table. That would be my, my uh, advice. So um, there are some solutions, margin scheme, administrative burden, additional costs, but you can save a market. You can save jobs. You can save your business if you're in the margin scheme. Now, Northern Ireland, I've mentioned this a fair bit already. Um, it is unique because it's, it's part of the EU now. Uh, but it's also part of the UK. Uh, but it, it's also neither, in, if you look at it from the right angles. Um, so so you've, you've got to really think about how you deal with Northern Ireland. And it, it has led to a lot of, of queries. Um, and I, you can see further down an example. Um, machine made in Italy goes to Northern Ireland. Italians invoice GB um, uh, middleman, if you like, uh, intermediary. And uh, GP intermediary invoice in Northern Ireland. What on earth do you do with the VAT goods arriving in Northern Ireland from the EU? What is that? You've got um, invoices from uh, Great Britain into Northern Ireland. How do you invoice that? Um, and do you invoice it as if it's an import, or an acquisition? What do we do? There's, there's that kind of question coming up. And the, the, the answers are there. Um, but it's, it's, um, it's partly uh, bespoke. So depends very much on the facts, the exact fact pattern. Um, and um, uh, partly, do, do other EU member states recognise Northern Ireland? They're supposed to, but in practice, when we're back to communication again, flush out those issues um, where, where questions are being raised and, and people aren't quite sure uh, what they're supposed to be doing. Coming back to um, the UK, Northern Ireland specifically, we're talking about movements of goods into Northern Ireland because Northern Ireland is now part of the EU and there's a, a boundary in the Irish Sea where goods cross it, import into the EU from Great Britain, import from the EU into Great Britain. Um, services are not affected. Um, so this is where we're beginning to see Northern Ireland is both part of the UK and the EU. But services are going to be straightforward. Goods is where the, the problem really is, I think. And let's start at the beginning. It, You've got a GB number uh, as a UK business. If you're moving goods in and out of Northern Ireland, get an XI number. Um, all that is is your GB VAT number with an XI at the start. But unlike PVA, you can't just start doing that. Um, it has to be logged on a database, a database, BIES, which is used by other EU member states, um, customers, businesses, and so on, um, to check that your VAT number is valid. The EU trade. So you need to talk to HMRC and get HMRC to um, say, yes, this is an XI number and put it on the list. Once you've got that, you can do things like triangulation in the EU, potentially. But there are risks with that. First of all, I've had two cases where the French uh, businesses simply haven't recognised Northern Ireland um, XI numbers as being valid. So you need to talk to them and flush it out and we can help you show them the legislation. Northern Ireland Protocol has said Northern Ireland remains unaffected and put for all of that rules as part of that union. And that will include triangulation, how can it not? Um, you've got um, uh, issues such as um, goods arriving in Northern Ireland from Great Britain and moving on to the EU. We're arguing, UK is arguing, for there to be no checks at the border in the Irish Sea. Well, that's good until the EU starts to worry about goods not being checked, no import duty, no, no nothing, just flooding into the EU. Um, so these goods are labelled at risk um, and those goods need to be reported. And there's something called the Trader Support Service um, that will help you do that. 
how to identify them, bit of moving target start this year, um, and how and what different procedures you need to go through. Um, and as we know, it's a, a bit of a battle of, um, between the EU and, and the UK government at the moment. So watch that space. Um, so what, what do you do? I'd get your XI VAT number. Um, easy to record, get your XI Yori number so you can clear goods through customs and identify yourself. Pretty straightforward as well. And then it's really a case of analysing your supply chains, knowing that if um, Northern Ireland pops up, there, there's going to be issues that you need to, to confront and deal with. And once you've got them sorted, um, then you keep going. But getting it sorted early on is, is absolutely key. Um, I think that's probably enough about Northern Ireland. If you do have questions or you do get involved in Northern Ireland, um, do raise your hand and, and uh, we'll help you address it. But I want to move on to one-stop shop as, as time is, is moving on quite quickly. Started on the 1st of July, You'll have read in the press that it's the one-stop shop. You'll have read in the press it's about e-commerce. You might have read in the press it's about goods. It's it's not. Um, it is, but that's that's not what it. It's not where it starts. It's not what it's all about. There are other implications that will get missed, opportunities that will get missed. So let's get to the heart of this. What are we talking about? We're talking about goods which. And it doesn't sound like it applies to, to us in, in Great Britain, but bear with me. Sounds like it, it applies to goods which move from one EU member state to another, where previously, before Brexit, you'd have applied something called the distance selling rules, and that meaning of that term still, it's changed, the term's still here, but the meaning is different. Distance sales, you'd have applied and charged VAT in the country of dispatch. And what are we talking about there? So if you manufacture goods in France and you sell in France and you also sell in Belgium and you also sell in Italy, you also sell in Spain, you would charge French VAT in all of those sales up to fairly generous limits. And you wouldn't have to register for VAT in the country where the goods arrive. The new rule says VAT is not going to be charged in the country of dispatch. It's going to be charged in the country of arrival. And that means your French company is going to have to register for the 18 Spain and Italy and Belgium and all other member states in the EU where goods are delivered. And that is a huge economic and administrative burden on the French supply. And one of my clients is working through this. I think they worked it out to be something like £80,000 a year in software and man hours and um, other costs. So for most businesses, that just isn't feasible. Um, and the EU has um, put in place legislation which will allow uh, the French supplier to register only in France, but account for the VAT that arises in Spain, Italy, Belgium, and anywhere else in the EU. And that is the Union One Stop Shop. But it's not just the union one-stop shop. There's also the import one-stop shop, the non-union one-stop shop. You can choose to use more than one one-stop shop, apply for them and, and apply them according to each supply differently. You could use none of them out of choice, or it might be that you can't use a one-stop shop, even if you register one your, your, your um, supply simply doesn't qualify for the one-stop shop. Let's take an example. Supplies in GB, and it's important there are no EU establishments for, for the GB supply. They're selling through Amazon or eBay or other online marketplace. To a consumer, it's business-to-business -business supplies. You're not going to be worried about who's going to account for VAT in the country of arrival. And if, if that's a question for you, do, do raise your hands as to why that's not the case. Uh, they're not supplying services. We've talked about that. It's, um, uh, it, it's very different. And this is a, an example about goods. And the goods move from Great Britain into the EU. We're not talking about goods going from one EU country going to another. And importantly, the consignment value is 150 euros or less. 
what do we do? If we don't do anything, what happens? Why, why are we worried about it? Well, these are the winners in, in all of these changes for EU trade. You're making a supply of low value through an online marketplace, and that means the online marketplace will be responsible for the VAT on the whole transaction. There won't be import VAT under uh, an import one-stop shop, or if there is, then the marketplace chooses to, to pay it, so, so be it. And, and then there will be VAT on um, the sale within the EU, and the online marketplace will take care of that as well. As, as the supplier is zero rating your export, and you have no further involvement. Fantastic. It's awkward for the electronic interface. What the UK is calling the online marketplace. Amazon, eBay, they're now deemed the supplier. They have to deal with all of this. They have to work out when they have to deal with it and when they don't. It's also awkward for those winners in that if they get a bumper sale and they start to grow and the consignments are valued over 150 euro, they will be responsible and how they're going to deal with that. Maybe not as straightforward as we thought, but there is a clear win here. So let's, I was going to work through all the, the different examples. Um, and if you take six factors and say they're binary, yes or no, there's 720 combinations out. Not going to go through these. I'd bore myself, I think, if I did that. But I am going to look through a couple of examples just to give you a flavour of the sort of issues that, that come up and, and the sort of solutions that you should be sort of thinking about. So, for example, same example, same um, scenario, um, but the sale, instead of being via a website, is not via a website. What do we do? Well, the implication is that you're going to pay EU import VAT. We don't do anything. And you're going to have a sale if your own goods haven't been bought them into the EU. You're going to have a sale in the EU. And you're going to have to register for VAT in every EU member state where that sale, uh, where those goods arrive. £80,000 a year, let's not do it. There is an import one-stop shop, as we mentioned earlier. And what that does is it removes import VAT. Well, that's a big bonus. You don't have to worry about whether you're going to reclaim the VAT through 13th directive or whether you're going to reclaim the VAT in a VAT return you registered locally, whether you can't do it at all. How are you going to do it? No import VAT. Also, rather like the French company we spoke about earlier, you get to have one VAT registration only in a member state of your choice. So if there's a language barrier and there's a simpler place, register there. If um, there's an easier uh, government to deal with, register there, um, and so on and so on. There's lots of factors. So this is good for uh, people selling um, uh, small items below 150 euro per consignment. Um, if they're going through eBay and Amazon, um, they've got uh, the Amazon and eBay uh, are responsible. If they're selling outside of that, um, they've got the import one-stop shop. And again, they're, they're, they're winners, really. Um, there is a bit of admin to sort out, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. What about supplies of services? I've, I've said they're not really talked about um, in, uh, in the press very much. Well, what we're talking about are supplies where... Um, of services where the place of supply is in the EU and uh, EU VAT is, is locally to be accounted for. So if you're supplying an individual, um, you, you've um, land, it's one of the exceptions typically, so something like land related supplies um, or, or um, electronically delivered supplies. Uh, and the place of supplies is where your customer is. And you're going to have to register for VAT there if you don't do anything in, in every EU country where you've got a customer receiving service or where the land is, or whatever the rule that dictates. Um, and, and that was what it was like before Brexit as well. Brexit's got little to do with this. Um, but what you can now do, which you could do for the last sort of five or six years for um, electronically delivered services, but you can now also do for other services, um, so land-related is, is a typical example, you can register for the non-union one-stop shop. And that will allow you to account for VAT um, in one registration in one EU country, but account for VAT liabilities that you have across the EU. That's going to be a saving, and it's another winner. 
Go back to goods though. If your goods are um, above 150 euros, so you can't use the import one-stop shop, doesn't matter whether you're selling through a website or not, it's going to be your responsibility. You could simply register for VAT everywhere account for everywhere. But that becomes a burden. What you can do is adjust your supply chain. So you can get your, your goods flowing through one country and uh, account for VAT there, register for VAT there. And you can use the union one-stop shop to uh, account for the VAT on goods which move from that import country to other EU countries, uh, if you wish. The upside is it keeps the admin simple. The downside is you're going to have to route everything through one country, which may not make sense. It might be more expensive for transport. It might cause delays. Um, it might be that you're going south to go import into Holland, let's say, and then north to um, deliver to an individual in Sweden or something. And, and how does that make sense? And you've got to work your way through um, what your uh, supply chain is, what the numbers are, um, and what's the best balance I can achieve. The one advantage, one of the many advantages of the adjusted supply chain um, is it's flexible. If you get a big market in Sweden, you can do the same thing in Sweden, register in Sweden because it's worth it, the numbers stack up now and ship everything direct to Sweden. Um, it, it's flexible. So in summary, um, there's a risk if you don't do anything of having to register for that in every EU member state. There are winners, but most businesses are going to suffer from the requirement to register for that everywhere. Question mark over how you recover import VAT in, in every EU member state. So what you need to be doing, I'd suggest, is reviewing those supply chains. Many of you will have done already. Understand the impact from these new VAT rules. Consider what the solutions are. Get some knowledge on your side and work through those potential solutions. And then as early as you can, get in there and get those registrations sorted. It does take time. And don't forget to amend the terms of your sale. Communicate with everybody in the chain, even if that's only by putting the terms up on a website. It's got to be done so it is clear. Let's talk about the domestic reverse charge. I, it's been a very big year for VAT. Not only have we had Brexit and the imports and exports, and then six months later, which didn't help the, the, the rule changes for EU trade, we also had a change in the construction industry where subcontractors would charge VAT to main contractors and the main contractors would recover it. And the government thought there's a problem here because what we're seeing, they tell us, is that many subcontractors would collect the VAT from the main contractor when they're paid by them. And while that subcontractor should pay that VAT up to HMRC, they weren't doing it. They were just disappearing with the VAT. And HMRC were losing out apparently quite significantly. So they said, I know the way to deal with this. Um, it's been operated for years in international trade decades even. By the reverse charge, remove the VAT payment from customer to supplier. So the supplier can't disappear with it. Make sure the customer accounts for it directly to HMRC. So the reverse charge is where the customer um, sells that service to themselves effectively, or at least they account for the VAT on that sale as if they sold it to themselves. Then they get to reclaim that VAT um, as a normal purchase. Um, and most people can recover VAT in full, but there are many people um, who can't, um, particularly somebody who's renting residential property and has not fit to tax um, and so on. When did it come in? First of March, earlier this year, so it's been around for a while. Um, but I suppose the question that, um, that we've, we've been working with is, is who? Um, and, and, and what? As a supplier, as a subcontractor, and also as a purchaser, you've got to make sure that what you're getting is right um, in terms of invoicing and so on, VAT. You've got to work out who are um, uh, correct suppliers and purchasers for this reverse charge to apply. And it's customers who then take those services and sell them on, very simply. It's not the end user. If you've got an end user as your customer, you charge VAT to them, no reverse charge. 
or more simple, um, subcontractors, um, you need to be making sure that your customer is registered for VAT and registered for CIS, as well as being an onward seller, not an end user. And you need to get all that in writing and keep it on your file. So you can show it to HMRC as a justification for not charging the ATM with a reverse charge. Otherwise, you, you should be charging the ATM. What supplies? Specified supplies. It's in the legislation. Um, if what you're doing is falls within one of those descriptions, reverse charge can apply. If it doesn't fall within one of those descriptions, reverse charge does not apply. Sounds simple. Actually, there's a lot of doubt around where these uh, the boundaries for these meanings um, falls. And HMRC, I've never heard this before, HMRC say in their guidance, don't charge VAT supplies, don't charge VAT and apply reverse charge, if you're in doubt. I mean, I find that extraordinary. Uh, there's always doubt, and there's there's doubt here in uh, quite a number of places. So just don't charge VAT, and surely HMRC are making a, a rod for back with that, but, but that's the guidance. Of, I, I know the rule is don't put too much on a slide, and, and this is just a block of text. All it's demonstrating is, is how widely drawn the specified supplies are in the legislation. And it includes things like painting and decorating, as well as you know, building a house or a wall or something. It's, it's quite widely drawn. Um, but at the same time, there are exclusions. You won't have um, a reverse charge applied to those exclusions. Something like drilling or testing the ground before work or architect services or the supply of staff or equipment. You'll charge VAT on those, unless you're not supposed to charge VAT on those. And this is where it starts to really get a little bit confusing. So it might be that um, those excluded, those sorry, accepted as the term, if those accepted services um, or supplies are in fact part of a uh, the, the main supply of, of uh, reverse charge construction work. In which case, that supply drilling or installation or what have you, will also be reverse charged and not subject to the AT. Or it might be that uh, a wider um, agreement between uh, non-end user customer and, uh, and supplier um, has been reached where one supply is reverse charged on the site and uh, it's agreed that the reverse charge will apply to, to all subsequent supplies. But you've got to look out for... Um, for, for, as we've already said, in fact, um, what status the customer has. Do you have a non-CIS customer? Do you have an end-user customer? What is an end-user? Defined it fairly glibly earlier. Actually, connected parties are also treated in the same way as an end-user, and that's charged to them. So we're talking about people with common interest in that land, so if there's a, there are a landlord supplying to a tenant, both landlord and tenant have an interest in the land. The landlord, although resupplied, selling on the, uh, the, the construction work, the painting, decorating, roof repair, it's, uh, they're, not, uh, they're not going to be able to take advantage of the reverse charge. And as a subcontractor, you have to know that so that you don't apply the reverse charge. Um, and of course, don't, the reverse charge only applies to positive rates of VAT. Um, where it's zero rated, um, no reverse charge applies, but there's no VAT anyway. Problems arising, we do see subcontractors who were charging VAT and collected it, didn't have to pay it up to HMRC for three months till the back return was due, uh, and they'd work with that as cash flow. Now they can't, and there's a big question, if there's no VAT on your sales, what do you do to improve things? You go on a monthly VAT return instead of quarterly because possibly you've got a whole bunch of um, costs to recover VAT on. And now your purchases, the VAT only purchases, greater than the VAT on your sales. So HMRC will pay you back that bit that more quickly if you're on a monthly return instead of a quarterly return. Are you on a flat rate because you're a relatively small subcontractor? Well, if you're on a flat rate, you can't recover VAT on your costs. There's no VAT on your sales anymore. Why on the flat rate? Go off the flat rate, recover the VAT on your costs. There are things to, to think about. 
And there's a lot more of uncertainty to be thought about. How are you going to deal with um, gosh, uh, supplies to uh, overseas companies, to uh, uh, public-private partnerships or government initiatives? Um, if you've got a, a, a VAT-registered CIS customer and you think, ah, reverse charge, they're VAT-registered, they might still be an end user. You know, uh, right Hassle is an all-service law firm. Um, we uh, are VAT-registered. Uh, if, if we get work done, um, decorating or repair or what have you uh, on our building, uh, we'll get an invoice. We'll look like the reverse charge should apply um, until you realise that we don't actually sell on um, those, those services. We are an end user and the VAT should be charged. Um, but you've got also you know, boundaries. It's always boundaries between the supply of um, somebody who's going to do work on the site um, and um, the work itself. But I have to send somebody on to do the work that I'm providing. You charge VAT on the supply of somebody who's going to uh, work on the site for somebody, somebody else. Uh, and you don't charge VAT, you apply the reverse charge where you're supplying the work yourself, but you're sending your own person on to do the work. That's a fine line. Section 106 agreements. You're having to um, to build a road or to build a building or, or any other kind of planning game uh, works. Does the reverse charge apply for that? These aren't easy questions to answer. There's a transition period. Um, uh, when you're issuing a sales invoice, what do you do? There's a day minimus limit called a 5% disregard. If you're working on a site, 5% goes one way or the other. You don't have to worry about that, just treat the whole thing the same. Um, do you fill out reverse charge sales lists? as you do for other domestic reverse charge, and avoidance domestic reverse charges. You don't, but it's a question that might come up. So if you're a supplier, what do you do? You've got to talk to your customer. It's communication again. Get from them confirmation of the VAT number, CI status, and whether they're an end user or not, or connected to an end user or not. Once you know that you're within the territory of reverse charge, which of your supplies are reverse charge, which ones are not. If you've got a mix, most people have a mix, a portion, how are you going to do the apportionment? Think about, as a subcontractor, coming off the flat rate scheme, going on to monthly VAT returns. Might help you. As a customer, make sure the supply is VAT registered. If they're not charging you VAT and you start complaining, it might be they don't need to charge you VAT. You've got to make your declarations to the supplier. Tell them your VAT register, tell them your CIS, tell them your end user status. Make sure the VAT rates charged to you are apportioned sensibly. That might be different from the, um, the, the VAT rate on your, your, your sale because the subcontractor's working on one part of the building. And if you're applying the reverse charge, you've got to work out what is reverse charged and what's simply the zero rated or, or what have you. And both of you together, supplier and customer, is it going to be easier for you to have a, a contractual agreement where all suppliers across the site are treated the same way under the reverse charge? Customers might not think so, um, but it might be easier overall. This if in doubt thing that I mentioned earlier that HMRC said uh, with the DRC, if in doubt, don't charge VAT, apply the reverse charge. There was a case just about a year ago now, um, Deluxe Property Holdings. They charged VAT because they weren't sure. They shouldn't have charged VAT and the customer found out by trying to reclaim it back from HMRC. The customer went to supplier, Supplier to make a section eight claim to HMRC, which is awkward, to say the least. HMRC can be can be very difficult with it. Um, supplier entered administration. Customer hadn't received the refund. HMRC um, the supplier can go directly to HMRC in exceptional circumstances. And this is pretty exceptional to get the VAT back direct, but the funds had already been passed to the supplier. The supplier having it passed funds on to the customer. So it now fell within the hands of the administrator. It's 
I can't say that HMRC is right to say if in doubt don't charge VAT. But I, I know out there there is this thought that if in doubt charge VAT is, is, is probably more appropriate. I, I, have to, I can't convey either. There are problems at both ends of, of that spectrum. It's, it's better for everybody reputation-wise if, if you just focus on, on the issue and get that VAT right in the first place. And then you can forget about it, just let it unwind. Um, but you know, that's my view. Early termination charges, and I don't have to be aware of time here because we're, we're um, already running slightly late. Um, there are plenty of slides here. I will quickly move through them, but in order to get to the end, uh, people have days to get on with. Um, I'm gonna move through them very quickly. Do raise questions if this applies to you. Early termination charges, in a nutshell, it used to be thought that if a contract is cut short and a, a, a payment is made by the party cutting it short, that is compensation. And that is not subject to VAT. You don't, as a recipient, you don't lose a sixth of that uh, cash that you've been paid. The courts uh, at European level have said, no, usually that payment is connected with the supply that was made, which was taxable, and therefore the compensation also is taxable. So all sorts of questions. How does it work with penalties? Um, how does it work with um, late payments and interest charges and dilapidations uh, and so on? HMRC wanted to apply this retrospectively as well, but they've relented on that. They appear to be um, weakening on the dilapidations argument as well. This is something to... Um, keep in, in mind if you're receiving compensation payments, it should it be subject to VAT, HMRC thinks it does. Is HMRC always right? No, it's not. Um, should you push back against it, you need to have a look and review and think about things. To reinforce that, um, in June this year, um, I know we're not part of the EU, but European cases are influential because our, our laws are, are based on, on EU terms still. So the meaning is, is uh, it can be understood from what the EU uh, uh, judges say, um, and in parking, there's big money out there at the moment. We've been seeing it for years, that cases on, on parking fees. There's another one here. There was a penalty um, for parking, um, thought to be that free compensation. And we haven't had the EU decision yet, but the um, Advocate General for the EU has opined and said they're not that free. There's VAT on penalties. EU court may well follow suit. UK may well follow the EU court. May not, but, but watch that space. It's consistent with um, with the early termination stuff. Sale and lease back, Balhousie. If you're a charity and you make a supply of the land and you lease it back, and um, you've got a party there constructing something for you, it can be a big fat benefit. If you're not sure how, uh, by all means, ask me afterwards. Um, if the charity makes a supply of the, the land, sells it, then that breaks its relevant charitable purpose. Why is that important? It's important because they'll have got zero VAT on their purchases uh, on the grounds that they're gonna use it for relevant charitable purposes. And if they break that in a 10 year period, then they have to pay VAT. Um, it's a complex calculation, but essentially they're, they're gonna to have to pay uh, a, a chunk of the VAT to HMRC for, for breaking that rule. Sale and lease back looks like it breaks it, um, went up and down through the courts, but um, the Supreme Court said, this is where the judgment stops. And the Supreme Court has said, there is no transaction here. There is no sale. I guess there's no lease back. I guess this could be used in, in, the, in the future. Um, client of mine, we were talking about this just, the, just last week. And it wasn't clear whether there was an options tax in place. Do we just ignore the entire sale? Um, covering VAT on costs, uh, I'm going to try and get through this quickly as well. Major, major planning point this. Um, you've got VAT on costs. Do your activities justify the recovery? Um, there was a state's um, funded education um, uh, business which agreed a partial exemption special method for recovering VAT on all of its costs and charging VAT where it was making um, supplies which uh, didn't qualify for uh, as supplies, non-business supplies. Um, you can't really do that. 
um, but, but HMRC agreed to it. And then, whatever you think of it, after the four-year cap, when HMRC can't make changes, um, and, and you can't make changes, it was argued that these supplies should no longer be subject to the AT because they're exempt business supplies. Now, that would normally mean that you have to go back and, and um, correct the original claim because it was an exempt business supply and pay all that VAT back to HMRC. But because it was outside the four-year cap, they couldn't correct that mistake and HMRC couldn't assess for it. Um, court said, actually, if you're going to um, correct a mistake, you've got to correct all the mistakes, uh, both input and output, um, even if you're out of time for the assessment. So you've got to take the correct steps if you're going to take advantage of an opportunity, um, highlighted by those further three cases below, there was a, a pathway built to, to wend its way through uh, Woodland, um, thought to be a non-business activity by HMRC. Um, whereas, in fact, uh, there was a gift shop and the pathway drove foot full past the gift shop, increased taxable sales. And uh, VAT could be recovered on the pathway, even though the uh, the, the pathway with the um, drive to taxable supplies was, was fairly incidental, but the link was clear. Try that with theatres and opera houses and you have mixed results. There's got to be that link in place. You've got to take the right steps, but there are opportunities. And it's a big part of planning is, is recovering the ATL costs. Last thing, um, the option tax, just in case you missed it, during the pandemic, um, normally, yeah, yeah, you used to have 30 days to uh, submit your options tax, had to be done by post, uh, and it took forever, it would take a couple of months to get HMRC's agreement to it all. During the pandemic, 30 days extended to 90, and you could submit online. That should have been kept, in my view, but it hasn't been. It's gone from 90 days back to 30 from the 1st of August, in case you missed it. And um, But you can still submit uh, electronically, but you need to provide evidence for electronic signatures. Um, so something just to bear in mind at, at the end there. Can't rely on anything I've said today. Uh, it's a bit of a joke, but uh, actually um, VAT depends very much on the facts. It's like a kaleidoscope. You get the, the facts in a certain pattern and you work your way through that when you're planning the VAT um, solution. And I, I don't know what your clients or, or your facts are, um, so do do come to me and, and we can talk that through if, if you have any queries. And if you do have queries, those are, are my details there. Um, uh, contact me by email, by phone, or if you've got any questions, um, do please raise them now. Thank you very much. can see one q and a um i'll read it out uh it says is importing from the eu now the same as importing from any other third country that is you pay vat on import although theoretically the eu exporter charges zero percent vat um if i haven't covered this already and i don't think i've specifically answered it um Yes, the import into the EU is exactly the same as from any other third country. But the um, rules for importing from all third countries um, have changed slightly um, post-Brexit. The export from the EU country will be zero rated, should be anyway. Um, the import into Great Britain, there will be import VAT unless you qualify for the um, the 135 threshold. There will be UK import VAT. And the question then is who's going to account for it? Um, will it be you? Or will it be uh, a VAT registered UK business customer? Or, or how will it be accounted for? And if you do account for it, will it be under postponed VAT accounting? So you call it in your VAT return claim back, no cash flow? Or will you physically pay the VAT um, and, and claim it back in, in, in your VAT return a few months later? Um, there's a number of questions to, to resolve there. It's it's slightly different from what it was pre-Brexit. But yes, you're absolutely right. You pay the import um, VAT, um, uh, even though the supplier is, is zero rating their export. I hope that helps. I can see um, in the chat uh, a few other queries. Um, 
uh, essentially asking for slides. Um, yes, by all means, um, write uh, to us. You've got my email address there uh, or contact um, the events team um, who you were contacting initially to, to sign up. Um, we'll, we'll send you through a, a PDF of, of the slides, um, which I, I know will, will be helpful to you. Um, and it also have my contact details on so when we get in contact. I think, I think that, oh, there's another question. Um, how easy is it to find a fiscal representative for a UK business wanting to use the import on stop shop? Let me adjust how I sit because this um, isn't the most straightforward um, answer to, as always, a very simple question. The first thing I would um, suggest is to challenge whether you need a fiscal representative. Um, I've been hearing many um, businesses, individuals in EU countries saying, we need to set you up with a fiscal representative. There are many different types of representative, in fact. And uh, half of the EU countries don't need one for VAT. The UK didn't when we were part of the EU. Um, the one-stop shops, the legislation does talk about uh, a representative, but you only need one if there's no mutuality between um, the EU and the third country, in this case, the UK. Um, mutuality is an unclear concept. There are things we're mutual on with the EU and some things that are still being discussed. But I'd start with the position that we don't need uh, a representative for one-stop shops. You may, however, need a representative to represent you to customs. Um, and whether um, how that bit works, which isn't um, so much VAT, you're beginning to move outside my, my area of expertise and experience now. Um, it, would it be your transporter? Do you need your own customs representative? Probably worth um, pushing back just to see what the what explanation you get from whoever's telling you you need one. Let's assume you need one. Um, how easy is it to find? Uh, I have myself a, a network of contacts through the EU, um, and there are a couple of uh, UK um, providers of services for all EU. Um, in my experience, it is just me. Um, those uh, sort of global providers um, are uh, not as... Um, detailed in their local knowledge as going to somebody in the country of choice where, where you want to, to take the, the right steps. Um, I always personally prefer local knowledge um, and talking to that person, even if they don't know the answer, can they find out? But you know, it very much depends on how often you're doing it, how big's your pocket, how big's the transaction, what's your budget, um, and uh, and let's work through from, from there. But yeah, it, it, by the way, get in contact with me directly. Um, and uh, we'll we'll um, we'll put you in contact with uh, with somebody who may be able to help if uh, if you wish. Uh, just seeing in chat, there's another uh, point. Uh, again, just asking for for slides. Yes, quite happy to to provide slides. Um, do get in in touch. I think. That may be all the questions. Um, I hope that was helpful for everybody. Um, I know what it's like in these things. You, you, there was a lot of stuff there and it has been a big year for VAT. Um, if questions are, are bubbling up afterwards or you come across a scenario uh, and you're not quite sure how what I said uh, applies, um, I'm, I'm always happy to discuss. I mean, it's not the case that you pick up the phone and I'm going to start you know, charging a thousand pounds or something. Let's just talk it through and, and see if there is a way I can help you uh, or, or if there's um, a bit more of a sort of major project that, that needs sorting out. Let's just have that discussion first. Uh, I'm always happy to, to help. Um, so if there are no further questions, um, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Uh,